Good evening. I am Pastor Bush, and I serve the saints at Glory to God Lutheran Church in Tinley Park and Our Redeemer in Grant Park, and I'm pleased to be able to serve you this evening as well, this afternoon. It's not evening yet. Let's not rush it. Uh, as you are probably well aware by now, this uh, Lent season, the, the focus is going to be a little bit different. We're not going to necessarily walk through in the sermons that final week of Jesus' life. We'll save that for your other worship services uh, but the emphasis for the, the message is going to be on the doctrine of baptism. Um, and, and so we're going to dwell for, the, for five weeks on baptism and the beauty and the blessings that come from baptism. And, and today we get to emphasize um, the fact that we are family. You and I, we're family by water, um, not by blood and not by oath, not by religion or race, by water, by water. With that, we'll begin with our opening hymn, Christ Alone, the World's Redeemer. God bless our worship this evening.
Please stand. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. There is one body and one Spirit. There is one hope through which we are called. One Lord, one faith, one baptism. One God and Father of all. Peace be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. Almighty God, in our baptism, you have consecrated us to be temples of your Holy Spirit. May we, whom you have counted worthy, nurture this gift of your indwelling Spirit with a lively faith and worship you with upright lives through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. In baptism, God calls us out of darkness into his marvelous light to fellow to fellow, to follow Christ means dying to sin and rising to new life with him. Therefore, I ask, do you renounce the devil and all the forces that defy God? I renounce Do you reject the powers of this world that rebel against God? I reject Do you repent of the sins that separate you from God and neighbor? Do you turn to Christ as Savior and Lord? I turn to Christ. Christ claims you for his own. Receive the sign of his cross. Do not be ashamed to confess the faith of Christ crucified. Almighty God, deliver those you have claimed from the powers of darkness. Restore in us the image of your glory and lead us in the light and obedience of Christ. Amen. You may be seated. We'll continue by singing verse 1 of our next hymn, God's Own Child. A reading for a meditation this evening comes from Galatians chapter 3. So in Christ Jesus you are all children of God through faith. For all of you who were baptized into Christ have clothed yourselves with Christ. There is neither Jew nor Gentile, neither slave nor free, nor is there male and female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. We'll continue with the second verse of that hymn, God's Own Child.
passion history for this evening comes from Mark chapter 14. Now the Passover and the festival of unleavened bread were only two days away. And the chief priests and the teachers of the law were scheming to arrest Jesus secretly and kill him. But not during the festival, they said, or the people may riot. While he was in Bethany, reclining at, a, at the table in the home of Simon the leper, a woman came with an alabaster jar of very expensive perfume made of pure nard. She broke the jar and poured the perfume on his head. Some of those present were saying indignantly to one another, why this waste of perfume? It could have been sold for more than a year's wages and the money given to the poor. And they rebuked her harshly. Leave her alone, Jesus said. Why are you bothering her? She has done a beautiful thing to me. The poor you will always have with you. And you can help them any time you want. But you will not always have me. She did what she could. She poured perfume on my body beforehand to prepare for my burial. Truly, I tell you, wherever the gospel is preached throughout the world, what she has done will also be told in memory of her. Then Judas Iscariot, one of the twelve, went to the chief priests to betray Jesus to them. They were delighted to hear this and promised to give him money, so he watched for an opportunity to hand him over. On the first day of the festival of unleavened bread, when it was customary to sacrifice the Passover lamb, Jesus' disciples asked him, Where do you want us to go and make preparations for you to eat the Passover? So he sent two of his disciples, telling them, Go into the city, and a man carrying a jar of water will meet you. Follow him. Say to the owner of the house, he enters, The teacher asks, Where is my guest room, where I may eat the Passover with my disciples? He will show you, a large room upstairs, furnished and ready. Make preparations for us there. The disciples left, went into the city, and found things just as Jesus had told them. So they prepared the Passover. When evening came, Jesus arrived with the twelve. While they were reclining at the table, eating, he said, Truly I tell you, one of you will betray me, one who is eating with me. They were saddened, and one by one they said to him, Surely you don't mean me. It is one of the twelve, he replied, one who dips bread into the bowl with me. The Son of Man will go just as it is written about him, but woe to that man who betrays the Son of Man. It will be better for him if he had not been born. While they were eating, Jesus took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take, this is my body. Then he took a cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, and they all drank from it. This is my blood of the covenant which is poured out for many, he said to them. Truly, I tell you, I will not drink again from the fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new in the kingdom of God. When they had sung a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. All of us who were baptized into Christ Jesus. We'll continue with our next hymn in 394, Come to Calvary's High Mountain.
who do you consider to be like family? Who do you consider to be your family? I think for most of us, the first answer is to say that the people that we're related to by blood are our family. That's the most obvious, our parents, our siblings, aunts, uncles, grandparents, children, grandchildren. These are the people by blood that we're related to, and they're our family. But then there are some other people that we might consider to be as good as family. Or maybe we like them even more than our own family. People that we're friends with and have been friends with for years and years. And we feel a closer bond to some of those people than to many of the members that we're related to by blood. What are the things that bind people together and, and, and make them say, that's my brother, that's my sister, when they're not related? It might be that something like war can, can bring people together. Men fighting in trenches side by side, facing death together. They might call each other brothers and feel a, a kinship with one another that the rest of us wouldn't understand. What else? What else can make people like family? There's there's always something. Right? We don't consider people to be family unless there's something that connects us to them, unless there's a bond between us, a shared creed, a secret handshake. There, there's got to be something that makes these people family to us. The Jews had that. Most of them were descendants of Abraham, so they shared blood. But for many of them, for more than we might think, they weren't related to Abraham by blood. There were converts to Judaism all around the world, people that had come to believe in the promises of the true God. And God had a specific order for them to become part of that family of God in the Old Testament. They had to go through a process of, of becoming part of the family. And, and one of those steps was circumcision for the men. If you weren't circumcised, you could never be part of the family. If you ate pork, you could never be part of the family. If you wore blended fabrics, if you ate shellfish, these were things that excluded you from being part of the family of believers in the Old Testament. It was very obvious. Very obvious to those inside Judaism, very obvious to those outside, who was in and who was out. As a matter of fact, Jews had a word for everyone that wasn't Jewish. And it was Gentile. They made up their own word just for all of the non-Jews even Americans don't have a word for the rest of the world that aren't Americans. But the Jews did. Gentile. Kind of a dirty word among Jews. Those people that eat, that eat the blood of the animal, that wear fabrics that they shouldn't, that, that eat pork that's forbidden by God to eat. They, they were a little bit upset a little bit shocked, a little bit surprised when Jesus came and fulfilled the whole Old Testament law. And Jesus said to them, tell the whole New Testament church to you, it's okay if you eat bacon. It's okay if you wear blended fabrics. It's okay if you walk more than a certain number of steps on Saturdays on the Sabbath. I've already fulfilled the law for you. Keeping those laws, that just helped remind you of what I was going to do. But it's done now. The role of the law, of that Old Testament Mosaic law, those things that kept people bonded together, that's gone and done with. But there was a group of people that weren't quite done with it. Yes, they believed that Jesus died for their sins, sure, but 
man, how do we really know that we are one with these people, that we're family with these Gentiles? We can't get away with making them follow the whole law, these Jewish Christians in Galatia thought, but, but maybe we can get, them, get away with telling them they have to be baptized. Uh, sorry, not baptized, circumcised. Maybe we can force them to get circumcised and we'll tell them they have to be circumcised if they want to follow God. And that way we know if they're part of the in-group or not. There can be a thing that binds us together that those Gentiles would never do so that we know who the real believers are. Because it's got to be something. Got to be something tangible. Got to be something that we can see to separate us from everybody else out there. And we'd like to think that that's a, a problem with these Christians almost 2,000 years ago. The, a problem that's ages past. But we really do like our own preferences, don't we? We really like to think that our, our preferences for worship style, they're not just good, and they're not just preferences. They're, they're the right choice. And some of those other Christians that worship a little differently than we do, they're weird, and maybe they're wrong. We can tell a good church by, by what the pastor wears when he gives a sermon. We can tell a, a good church by, by the liturgy that they use by the translation of the Bible, by the types of music that they sing. That's how we can tell for sure. Because if they sing that one song that we just really don't like, then they're on the outs. If only people saw it my way. If only people thought about everything the way I think about it. Then, then we could be together. Then we could be family. But until they get over themselves and come on to think about things the way I think about them, which is obviously the right way, we, we pretend that we don't do it. We pretend that we don't gossip about the other people in the pews. We pretend that we don't look down on other Christians for how they do things differently than us, but how much time we've spent complaining. The church would be so much better if only they would do what I wanted them to do. Things would work out so much better if we could just agree on this thing. And obviously, Agree with me. We're so desperate for that outward show. And we don't do it just in church. We do it outside of the church too, right? We can tell whether a person is good or bad by the type of flag they fly outside their doors. Or whether they have red or blue up on those signs during election season. We can tell whether they're good or bad by the posts that they make on Facebook, by their policy preferences in the government. We can tell whether they're good or bad by the language that they choose to speak. We'd like to think that we would never say, got to speak English in this country, as if that's some sort of law, as if that somehow makes a person better, but we look down on people for anything. It's because we want to elevate ourselves. We want to make ourselves feel better about our choices, and so we find things to, to complain about and everybody else inside the church and outside the church. And we really know better than these people that, that Paul wrote the letter to the Galatians against. And I say the letter against because he had some pretty harsh words. He says in chapter 5, if you let yourselves be circumcised, if you do one single thing, if you make one incision and move a piece of skin less than an inch, he says, Christ will be of no value to you at all. 
If you think even one action, even one tiny minor surgery can make you right with God, you have thrown away Christ. How much value should we really be putting in to our worship preferences, to our ministry plans? Do we value those things above Christ? Do we value those things above each other? Because Paul says if you do, if you let yourselves be caught in the trap of thinking that something other than Christ makes you good, Christ has become useless for you. I think Paul's message was probably very shocking to those Christians in Galatia. It made them pause. Lord willing, it made them stop right dead in their tracks. Both the Judaizing Christians, the Christians who wanted all Christians to look like Jews, and those Gentile Christians who weren't sure which path to choose, they stopped dead in their tracks and go, oh, <laughs> I didn't know it was so easy, so quick. This is only a couple of years after the Apostle Paul himself visited these churches at least twice and left leaders trained by the Apostle Paul himself. Can you imagine? Of course you can. Of course I can. We complain about people's views on ministry every day. I complain about worship styles way more than I wish that I would. I place value in things that God has no time for. But Paul has some words for us this evening. He says, in Christ Jesus, you are all children of God through faith. He, he had a harsh warning, a harsh rebuke. He said, if you walk down this path, you're giving up Christ, but, but he told them before that. You are all children of God through faith. For all of you who were baptized into Christ have clothed yourselves with Christ. When you, children of God, were baptized, whether it be a couple of years or a couple of decades ago, the waters of baptism removed from you all individual facets of your personality. It removed your personal preferences. The waters of baptism removed your ethnicity. It removed your language. It even removed your place in time. Because in those waters of baptism, you were brought back to the moment of Christ's death. You were baptized into Christ Jesus, into his death and resurrection. And as far as God was concerned, when those waters were poured over you, you were taken back to the cross, back to the grave, and everything about you that, that you wish weren't so is gone. And Paul made a very bold statement. He says, there is neither Jew nor Gentile. You'd like to think that there's this distinction between those who follow the Old Testament customs and the New Testament customs, he said, but that's gone. There's not slave or free. Those two groups, God doesn't see it. Not when it comes to your salvation. Not when it comes to your eternal life. Not when it comes to your status before God. Nor is there male or female. God created male and female. He wanted us to be different from one another. Yet in baptism, those differences disappear. God says of those differences that he created, don't let those get in the way. No man is better than any woman. No woman is better than any man because in baptism, you are all one in Christ Jesus. 
a baptism that is still effective to this very day in your hearts, that baptism which started the faith, which is able to make you a child of God. All of those petty squabbles that we have really are, are nothing. All of those outward signs that we think make us family, that, that give us bonds with people in the church, those really are nothing when it boils down to our baptisms because in baptism we were made family. Not by blood, not by law, not by carrying out the law as the Jews had done. Family by water. The water of your baptisms purified you and make you righteous before God and allow me to speak the same words that Paul spoke to those Galatians. Brothers and sisters, you are all children in Christ Jesus by faith. When we, when we leave, when we stand up from these pews, when we, when we pray together, when we go out and live in this messy, messy world where we're going to have differences of opinion, where some opinions are going to have more impact than others, where some preferences are going to have more impact than others. Start where Paul started. Start where God sees you. Look at the people sitting around you in the pews. Seriously, go look, look around. Look at all these people. These are all children of God. Every last one of them. They are your brothers and sisters in Christ Jesus by faith. You are more closely related to the people in the pews today than maybe you are related to your own family by blood. Because the family by blood, we are all different. Those of you who have siblings, especially those of you who have lots of siblings, you know how different one sibling can be from the next. You agree with me. <laughs> but Paul says you are all one in Christ Jesus. When God looks at this crowd of different faces with different experiences and different opinions, he doesn't see a whole bunch of different people. He sees one. One body of Christ. He sees all of you as the righteousness of Christ which was guaranteed to you at your baptisms. This is the power that baptism has in your life. Let it work in your life. Let the power of your baptism remind you every day that you are a child of God made one with these people in the pews around you. When you set to do the work of the church, be reminded that they are children of God just as much as you are. And God doesn't even see male and female. He sees one in Christ Jesus. You wouldn't treat yourself with disrespect. You wouldn't treat yourself as if you were a poor beggar. You wouldn't treat yourself as if you were a fool. So look at each other with such respect. It doesn't mean that we're sinless. Not yet. Not on this side of heaven. Man, it makes those, those meetings go a lot easier at church when you, you surround yourselves, not with people who disagree with you, but people who are one with you in Christ. People who are family by water. Baptism is pretty powerful. Pretty powerful reminder even today, whether removed, whether removed from that act by months, years, or decades, a baptism that gives you faith still purifies you. Still makes you clean. Still makes you a child of God. One in Christ Jesus. Family by water. Amen. We'll continue by singing together our...
Next to him, him 680, baptized into your name, most holy. Please stand for prayer. I thank you, my Heavenly Father, through Jesus Christ, your dear Son, that you have graciously kept me this day. Forgive me all my sins and graciously keep me this night. Into your hands I commend my body and soul and all things. Let your holy angel be with me, that the wicked foe have no power over me. may be seated for the collection of the offering. Please stand for the Lord's blessing. Hear us as we pray as Jesus taught. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. 
Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. The Lord bless us and preserve us from all evil, and keep us in eternal life. Let us bless the Lord. May be seated for our closing hymn. All praise to thee, my God, this night. One announcement from Pastor Schneider this evening. He says it has come to our attention that there have been text messages going out to the members of this congregation asking for gifts. The messages claim to be from Pastor Schneider, but they are fraudulent and come from another phone number. Please ignore these messages and block them where possible. We're sorry for any inconvenience. I joked with Pastor Schneider that you should just delete his number, so if any of you would mind just telling him that I actually told you to do that, I'd appreciate it. I'm sure he'd laugh. Uh, let's, uh, let's say the common table prayer before our meal this evening. Come, Lord Jesus, be our guest, and let these gifts to us be blessed. O oh, give thanks unto the Lord, for he is good where his mercy endures forever. Amen. Thank you for joining us for worship once again, and God bless the rest of your evening. <laughs>